Welcome, welcome. We are here and it is evening tea time. That's right. We're on the third and last show of the end of the week. And then we will be back next, next Thursday, three more shows. But let's get this one over with tonight. And we have in the in the studio with me tonight, joining and sharing on the 17th century sword fighting, horseback riding, music, you name it. We're going to talk it tonight on tea time. But before we get to that, we're going to do the disclaimer and we're going to do her quick bio and then we're going to jump in, have her jump in and share her tea tonight with all of you out there. So the disclaimer for Miss Liz's Tea Times live show. Miss Liz myself is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any Tea Time show hosted by myself, Miss Liz, is always brought forward in good faith, however, may bring forth dialogue and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the given time of airing. All Tea Time guests and audience participation are responsible for using their good judgment and taking any action that may relate to this, this discussion. The content brought forward may include discussions for some where they may be emotionally at risk. It is significant to know that this show is engaging in discussion forms only to offer and inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutical advice. If you have any questions about this disclaimer or the panelist discussion, you may freely contact me, Ms. Liz, at, through my email at bookingmissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in tonight's show, in any aspect, I miss Miss Liz welcomes you. Should you decide that the show is not made for you at this time, I respect that, and I will see you at a later show at a later date and time. So there we go. Disclaimer is out of the way. Now let me introduce my incredible guest that I have that has been supported and sponsored by Creative Edge tonight. Um, so I want to let you know that... To, Tonight we're going to talk some history, we're going to talk some 17th century, and we're going to really create a, a strong cup of tea. So, J.M. Landers, she is a sword fighter, warrior, author, and horse riding. And let me get, in addition to her work as a writer, editor, artist, and publisher, J.M. Landers teaches sword play and horseback riding, sometimes both at the same time. In Lang Langdale, B.C., she drew on this experience as well as her time as a rock musician and childbirth educator to inform her fantasy trilogies, Abigail Ag Aganel song. She is currently working on a new series, La Bur La Burgers, featuring a shepherd sh shepherdess turned spied into the 17th century France. And my tongue is getting tired. I think it's 
It's been a long day. So let me get J.M. Landers in here and let's spill some tea. Welcome, Jennifer. Hi, Miss Liz. Delighted How to be here. You? <laughs> <laughs> My tongue is just a twist, twist, twist. It's, it's so could you uh, let the viewers and listeners know where you're from and all of that good okay. stuff? All right. So, um, yeah, I'm, I write as J.M. Landles, um, and I'm based out of Langley, B.C., uh, and we're on the Stolo and Kwantlen First Nations here. And just as you were starting the show, the sun came out. It's still, it's still early evening here, and I wish you could all see outside my window because there's this beautiful golden sun hitting the dark sky, and it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, but it's, yeah kind of dark inside the house, but sorry, you can't see. Oh, wow. um, anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm here on my farm in Langley where I teach riding and horsemanship and mounted combat. And this is also my office where I write. And uh, I just released the third song in my trilogy, Elenia Song. Um, and that one, that one is not a 17th century. That one is a fantasy. I'm, and I'm currently working on a, a 17th century historical fiction series. Oh. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. And I'm sorry that I got the title wrong. Oh, no, don't worry. My it's my fault for creating a hard to pronounce title. <laughs> <laughs> so what got you into the 17th century writing? Um, well, interestingly enough, I, um, it was an area when I did my bachelor's degree in English, it was my least favorite area in English literature. Uh, and then later on, I guess probably about, uh, 15 years ago, I, I started, I, I decided to deliberately go back into that area, do some reading, do some research. And, um, I ended up getting really fascinated with the period. It's it's a very interesting period. It's kind of a borderline where where scientific thinking is starting to take over from alchemy and and you know people like Isaac Newton were was both an alchemist and what we call a scientist these days. So it's a very you know very interesting conjunction of ideas happening in that century. Then what happened? Um, as I was researching that, I found that there was a school in Vancouver that teached that teaches um, swordplay because I was researching 17th century rapier and lo and behold, oh, there's a course in 17th century rapier and it's right here in Vancouver. Sign me up. Uh, and that was, oh gosh, that was, it must have been at least 12 years ago. Wow. Um, uh, so that uh, took me down a swordplay rabbit hole for quite some time, uh, which then, you know, became another profession in that I ended up starting a mounted combat program and teaching people how to use swords as well as ride horses. So, so is it really challenging to sword fight and ride a horse at the same time? Uh, the hardest part is riding a horse. If you know how to ride a horse, you've got, I would say, 80% of the job done. Um, so learning the sword play is a lot easier than learning the riding, especially as an adult. You know, we often learn riding when we're kids and that's when it's really easy. And then as an adult, it does take a lot of hours in the saddle. Um, so, go ahead. But, uh, you know, it is something we teach people, even if you've had no riding at all, you know, you know, we will have you up and with a sword in your hand on horseback within a year. Wow. One year. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it might take me one year to ride the horse. <laughs> so the weight of the sword and the sound of the swords hitting, that, that doesn't make the horses afraid or? Horses get used to it really fast. Um, they're just, they don't tend to be bothered by sword play that much. Once they know that you're not there to hit them, um, they, they kind of fall asleep. Oh. Yeah, I, I, you know, I have a thoroughbred that I use This is my main horse and she can be having her thoroughbred moments. And, and as soon as I pick up a sword and she sort of goes, oh, OK, it's this and time, time to have a nap. <laughs> so does it take a lot of work to learn how to use a sword? 
on the horsemen? Well, what we do is we start people on the ground with the sword. So okay. we, we do it separately. So, you know, your class is in the morning, you're learning how to ride and look after your horse. Your class in the afternoon, you're learning the sword play. And then when we feel you're at a sufficient level of both, then you get to combine them. So and how long have you been riding horses? All my life. <laughs> I've got a picture of me as a baby on a horse, you know, <laughs> so before I could walk. Um, I think my first, my first full sentence was, I want a horse. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so do you remember what your first horse looked like? Oh, yeah, my first tour. Oh, you never forget any of your horses. Never mind your first one. My first uh, pony, um, my my dad finally caved when I was eight years old and uh, they he got me a pony uh, which was a little Shetland or Shetland cross uh, Pinto Dark Bay Tobiano uh, and uh, yeah he was a little stinker but he taught me a lot <laughs> so we have a question here in JM what changed your mind for the 17th century I think it was just a deliberate, I wanted to research, I, I, I wanted to get back into history. I I'd sort of abandoned my, my PhD thesis in medieval English literature when I, the BC government wouldn't give me a student loan. And I said, oh, well, I'll just, I'll just stop studying for my PhD and I'll, I'll study um, and I'll, I'll do something different. That's when I joined a rock band. Um, oh. Because you know you can you can do a PhD any time in your life. You can only do a rock band when you're young. <laughs> <laughs> so do you want to share a little bit about your rock band? Uh, yeah. Um, well, it was uh, I had several. Um, I started out. Uh, it was I was living in London, England at the time, and so we, uh, you know, I just went. I I stopped my my thesis so i put that on hold i went and joined a, uh, a it was kind of a women's collective uh where they were doing classes in in sound engineering and things like that i had already learned guitar a bit uh, because my my significant other is a, an amazing guitarist and uh, he had taught me a little bit i'd done some I'd done some air band in university and we'd actually gotten quite good at that and, and opened for bands like the Scramblers at uh, clubs like Graceland in Vancouver. Um, but I thought, well, okay, I'm going to go and do this for real, try this out. So I, I did some sound engineering and then I answered an ad for a band which was Hellbent for Leather, looking for a rhythm guitarist. And that was the first, uh, it was an all girl band. That one broke up as bands do. We, some of the members of that band and I formed another band called The Sisterhood. Um, and then that band broke up as others do. And then I decided, well, you know, my partner here is an amazing guitarist. I should really be using him. So we put some recordings together. Uh, this was all in the UK. Then we moved back from England. We moved back to Vancouver, had another band here. And then, um, then once I got pregnant with my first, uh, I think we, our last gig, I was six months pregnant. And then after that, I stopped because there was just too much else going on in my life. So are you still in a band today or are you just... I'm not. My, my partner is. He's, uh, he's actually out rehearsing tonight. Um, every once in a while, I pick it up. But uh, yeah, I haven't done anything seriously. It was... Once I had little kids, there were it was really hard to find time to practice and you know, little hands reaching for the strings all the time. <laughs> uh, and you never want to wake up the babies. <laughs> oh, you were a big hardcore rocker. Um, yeah, we we was indie. It was sort of indie punk metal. That sort of yeah. So in between heavy metal and rock. Yeah. So what was your favorite song to perform? Oh, favorite song to perform actually might have been some of the covers that we did. Like I used to, we used to always open by covering Shove by L7. Um, but of the ones of our own original stuff, I guess um, 
the wicked lady still has a soft spot in me and it's funny because that actually takes you back to that 17th century um because it's i watched the movie the wicked lady which is like an old um it's an old black and white movie and i just really hated the ending so i wrote a song with a better ending oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> So what what year was that movie made, Wicked Lady? Oh, it's it's why well, I don't know, nineteen thirties, I guess. I I can't remember now. Uh, so it's a black and white movie. An old black and white movie, yeah. Yeah, oh, about a highway is. woman. But she ends up dying, a spoiler alert, and I didn't like that. So I wrote <laughs> I wrote an ending where she didn't die. <laughs> that was that was the song <laughs> Wicked Lady. The Wicked Lady lived on. Yeah. Yeah, the full the full title is The Wicked Lady Rides Again. <laughs> Oh, I like that. That's that's pretty cool. That's like a bike and like a biker song. Like, yeah. Right on, right. So a little bit more about your books, JM. Could you share a little bit on how people can get your books and what what one like the like there's three of them, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah. So I've got um, three books. The first first one is uh, Elena's song Overture, and then we have. Elena's song Aria was the second, and then just released in December, the third book, yes. Corral. Um, so you can you can find them. Uh, there's a link on my website, stiffbunnies.com, but you can also find them directly from the publisher, publiterature.com, or on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Kobo, all those. It, it, if you type in my name, it'll it'll pretty much come up. It's an unusual cool. name. <laughs> so how did you get the titles for your books? Um, so Elenia is uh, this, the Elenia is the main character. Elenia's song is because her, it's a fantasy and her ability is to sing music into magic. So she can turn her voice, she can turn music into magic. And the three titles, Overture, Aria, and Chorale, reflect that. So Overture, obviously, is the beginning. Aria is the book, and middle book, when she is out on her own in the world. So it's it's that's her solo time. Um, and Chorale is all the voices coming together. So she's, uh, you know, you're you're getting all the storylines coming together because there are three three main storylines in each book. One is Elena's, and one is her grandmother, Dane, who is a seer, um, and she can see the future, not always accurately, but, um, and uh, she's, so that's um, her story, and then her mother's story, uh, because her mother, en route to her wedding, went missing for two weeks, and then her story is told what happened in those two weeks, that's told in the first book, and then in the second and third book, the stories of Erdane and Larissa, the mother and grandmother, fill in a lot of stuff you you kind of wondered about in the first book. So are these names from the 17th century? No, these books are not 17th century. So these are, these are pure fantasy, um, just set in an alternate world, a sort of probably, you know, Renaissance, medieval period fantasy world. Um, the 17th century stuff I'm working on is is a different series called La Bergera or The Shepherdess. Yes. And that one, um, some of those have been serialized in Pulp Literature Magazine. And there's there's currently um, an excerpt, where are we there? In this issue here, which is the fall issue. Uh, and that one is about a shepherdess turned spy in 17th century France. So have you ever been to France? Many times. <laughs> That's my go-to <laughs> holiday destination. Some people like to go to Hawaii. Some people, you know, want to go some, you know, Mexico. I go to France. <laughs> so how many times have you been to France? I've kind of lost count. Because when I lived in London, that was also our go-to destination. We lived in London for about four and a half years. So it, France is just right across the channel. We kind of hop on a ferry, rent a car, and and see which way the wind blew, which way we'd drive. But we very seldom got out of France because it, it, we liked it so much. The food is fabulous. Um, there are castles galore, you know, it's, and 
you know, being Canadian, um, you know, we could at least get by in French um, a little bit better than we could in Italian or German. So, so what was your favorite food in France? Oh, too many to name, but I do love a good cassoulet canard, which is, you know, a, a basically it's it's baked beans, but they're baked beans like you never tasted before um, with usually I, I like cassoulet with uh, with duck or or cassoulet d'oie, um, which is goose. Um, but usually they have other things in them as well. So they usually have they have the beans and they have sausages and they might have a little bit of lamb or some duck or some goose. It's kind of like anything that you any leftovers you have, but it is the most glorious glorious dish and they sell it in cans there and you would not believe that canned beans could taste so good <laughs> oh wow yeah 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 making beans is a big thing mm. here in canada right yeah we usually do them in the winter time i always make like a big pan of beans and beans and toast and have the mm. kids over and that so a little bit more on, on the horse play and the, the sword fighting. For anybody that would like to know more, like do you provide lessons in that as well? I do. Um, if you go to academycavallo.ca, uh, so that one is academy spelt with an I-E and cavallo, C-A-V-A-L-L-O, and it's a .ca. Um, there's a website there. There's a newsletter that you can sign up to and you can get um, articles on on sword fighting and and horsemanship and things like that. Um, and I do you know, for those people that are in the lower mainland of BC, I, we do weekly lessons. Like every week, we're out there teaching riding, teaching sword play, and uh, putting them both together. Yeah, because we had a little discussion before the show started because we said Cornwall, and I was like, oh. Let me see where she is. And then I'm like, oh, no, she's not in Cornwall. <laughs> oh, and for people for people on the East Coast, um, I may be going to Nova Scotia in July. Um, that's not 100% confirmed yet. It might be the July long weekend or it might be a couple weeks after that. Uh, so I'll be out there for a weekend teaching. So it's uh, Annapolis Valley Hema. Hema is H-E-M-A, which stands for historical European martial arts. Um, so they're bringing me out there. Oh, so if you're, if you're on the far east or the far west, um, somewhere in the middle, I, you know. <laughs> you like Cornwall? <laughs> <laughs> Other places I'm traveling to, I'm, I'm planning to go to Winnipeg for uh, Pemacon this summer, uh, which is uh, July. Well, I know it's on my birthday. Um, it's the middle of July. And then there's um, also hoping to go to Calgary for When Words Collide, which is the last When Words Collide conference, uh, the first weekend of August. So, and again, anybody in those parts of the country, um, get in touch with me if you, you know, if you'd like me to come out to your farm or whatever and, and do a lesson if you're, or your riding stable or whatever, or if you just like a sword play lesson, get in touch and, you know, I can do something. So is there different weights for the swords? Um, swords are not as heavy as, as people generally think they are. Um, like a, a rapier, which is your musketeer's sword. So that's like your long slender sword that the three musketeers would have used with the fancy grip. Um, that one, like a couple of pounds at most. Um, and then a long sword, which is your typical knight's sword. Again, only you know, two and a half to three pounds. Uh, so they're not super heavy. We use, on the ground, we use real swords. So they are real weight. They are the real uh, dimensions. They're made out of the same materials that would be made out of historically. Uh, the only difference is they're not sharp. Because okay. we like our friends and we want to continue to have people to play. <laughs> <laughs> I always wondered about that with the sword fights. Are they really like? Are they sharp to do the sword fighting? Um, well, you know, modern sword play, no, they're not sharp. 
uh, and they're blunted at the end, usually with like a rubber blunt at the end, and the edges are not sharp at all. However, they are still dangerous. Um, a long sword especially is, is a long piece of steel, and if you hit somebody with that, and if they're not wearing protection, that you know, you would definitely kill them if you hit them on the head with a long sword. So we do wear um, you know, fencing mask, like, like you see in the Olympics, the typical sort of fencing mask. And then depending on the type of weapon, if you're, if you're playing with long swords, you're going to want, you know, reinforced shoulders and chest and throat and all pretty much full body protection. With rapier, um, we don't wear as much armor. We still wear throat protection, which is a gorget. Um, we wear the mask to protect the face and gloves and, and generally fairly thin gloves. And that's, you know, you can fence full speed with rapier with only that material. Uh, a lot of a lot of people like to wear a chest protector um, because, you know, you do get bruised. Um, so, you know, I'd say any, any women who have not yet had all their babies would probably want to wear a chest protector to protect those. <laughs> so is it heavy, the fencing outfit? Um, not particularly. And I mean, there are, I don't do armored fighting, which is in, you know, the, the metal armor, but even those, they are heavy, but they're very well fitted. So, you know, the armor is fitted to your body so that it rests at specific places on your waist and doesn't all hang off your shoulders, things like that. Your, the undergarments have strings on them to actually attach the, the armor to, your, to the padded um, underlay. And that actually supports the metal armor itself. So again, it's not just clanking around on your body, it's quite snug. So it's almost like a scuba diving suit? Not quite that tight. You still have to be able to, I mean, it's historical materials too. They didn't have rubber <laughs> so, <laughs> or neoprene. Um, but I mean, these days people do fight, like some people use lacrosse gear um, for, for long sword sparring and, um, you know, modern, modern things like that. So what's the heaviest sword, the weight of the swords that you've worked with? Um, well, I mean, a Spadoni is the, probably the heaviest sword I've used. The Spadoni is the, also called the great sword. Those are the ones that are, you know, as tall as I am. Um, and they're, you know, the handle itself is this long and, and you, they're, what they're basically used for, um, they would be crowd clearing swords. So one person with a spadone could hold an alleyway or say if you were on a battlefield and you had a standard um it's always very important to protect the standard of your of your army um and you'd leave one person with a spadone there or, or a great sword there because one person can swing it around and and keep a lot of people at bay so how much does that weigh that one is about four or five pounds, maybe. That's yeah. That's a good weight to be swinging around. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so everybody stay on a good side. <laughs> <laughs> so a little bit more on to, um, I want to get into the editing and, and the writing. So how long have you been writing and editing? Um, writing almost like writing. I've been doing most of my life. Um, I, I, um, I've got my mom saved booklets that I, that I made when I was four years old with, you know, one word per page, but nonetheless, I was putting books together back then. And, uh, I started writing novel. I, I, I wrote a novel when I was about 14 or I didn't write it. It wasn't a whole novel. It was a few chapters of a novel, which has been lost in the mists of time, very thankfully. <laughs> and we'll never see the light of day. Yeah, so there's something you want to lose, right? And you don't, you know, yeah, oh, there's... Yeah, a, I wrote that a long time ago. I don't want to see that again. Yeah, it's, the thing about writing is that even when you're just learning how to do it and practicing, it's on page and it can be saved. You know, when you're learning the clarinet or something, nobody's recording those first attempts. 
no, when you're learning how to dance, nobody's videoing you learning how to dance. But when you're learning how to write, you're putting it down on paper and it can be saved. And that's not necessarily a good thing. So for the editing, how long have you been doing editing? I, hmm, I guess I started doing um, with the Childbearing Society in, oh, I guess probably around 2000s, early 2000s, I was putting together their newsletter. So that's when I started sort of doing it as a, as a job. Um, and I, I did their newsletter and I, I put together their handbook and then, and then I was doing other sort of freelance editing. And then in 2013, um, my writing partners and I put together pulp literature magazine. And so then that's been full on editing since then. So are you working with like any organizations or uh, for writing, like writing programs or anything like that in BC? Um, no, we have our, at pulp literature, we do have our own writing program, which is slight, it was on hiatus at the moment. We'll be reviving in 2023, which is quit the day job. Um, and you know we'll be providing writing courses there i do teaching at conferences and things like that or i've been invited to teach at the editors canada workshops and things like that so you know i, I do sort of sporadic gigs i would say so what what is it about editing that you enjoy uh well, i like making things better <laughs> <laughs> i love that answer <laughs> Right? That needs to be fixed. It's like the song in the movie, right? The Wicked yeah. Moment. Like. Yeah. I mean, it's it's very satisfying. It's very satisfying to take something that you can see something in and polish it to, to bring the beauty out. Like, a, you know, we, it's an old cliche about a diamond in the rough. You know, you, you can, when you, and then when you polish it, then you turn it into something that's uh, presentable in a necklace or something. <laughs> was that a little final touch that you need to put on. Yeah. So now let's get into the childbirth educator. What's that all about? Uh, well, I after my first daughter was born, I decided I, I got quite interested in childbirth and I ended up taking a childbirth educator, educator's course through, um, well, at the time it was Vancouver Community College. It's since moved to Douglas College. Um, then I had my twins and then I, after that started teaching and I, I did that, I guess for about seven years. And then after about seven years, I decided, oh, um, I, I think I've done all I need to do here. Um, but ironically, and this is a, this is a scoop. Um, this is the first place anybody's hearing this publicly. I am kind of thinking of dipping my toes back into the into the childbirth and postpartum field again. Um, I find myself yelling at the television a bit when there are news articles on and feeling like I have some information out there that I need to share. Um, so yeah, I'm 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 thinking of I don't know whether it's going to be a podcast or a newsletter or something. Um, called and the the working title is desert island parenting which is i feel like new mothers are just bombarded by all this information from all these sources um and i always when i was doing postpartum support i'd always ask moms well what would you do if you were on a desert island and there was nobody else around how would you how would you be handling your baby how would you be dealing with sleep and things like that and it's and usually well that's kind of what you should be doing is is you should be yeah sleeping when your baby sleeps you know you get by as best you can uh, and that's usually what's best for baby and what's best for you we have a question here someone's asking what is postpartum oh postpartum is just the period after your baby's born so it's usually considered a, about three months, but it 
it ranges. I mean, it's also used in the term postpartum depression, which can happen any time up to three years after the birth. Oh. So, so it's it's kind of a vague term. It's just it's just it just literally means after birth. I didn't know that it was up till three years. Yeah, the 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 vulnerable times for postpartum depression are right after the birth when all those wonderful pregnancy hormones have just gone out of your system. And if breastfeeding isn't going well and you're not getting the hormones from breastfeeding, that's oftentimes when postpartum depression can set in. But it can also set in like if you, when you stop breastfeeding later on um, or just from other life, you know, other life events can trigger it as well. But generally the highest risk factor is just when you stop breastfeeding, especially, you know, if you do it cold turkey, that's usually a, um, a big trigger for postpartum depression. So you mean like cold turkey for breastfeeding causes? Yeah, like you suddenly, you suddenly stop breastfeeding, right? And as opposed to the gradual sort of, normally what happens, you know, you feed, you breastfeed less and less. And finally, you know, eventually you just stop you know, it's going you down to one feet a day and then suddenly the baby or usually a toddler by that time isn't interested anymore. And so that's a very graduated weaning. When you just stop immediately, what your body thinks when suddenly you stop breastfeeding, your body thinks that your baby has died. I mean, our, our body doesn't know that, you know, like intellectually we know our, our baby's fine, but if you just suddenly stop breastfeeding, that, the hormone system of your body is reacting as if you have, and it's it's it making you your primitive brain think that you've got a dead baby or something's happened to your baby. That's why it's not it's not drinking anymore. I mean that's a very um, anthropomorphic way of thinking of of you know your body, but I guess your your body is. <laughs> I mean, your your body is human, um, but. Uh, yeah, so it's, I mean, that's a, that's a big trigger for, for postpartum depression. And our society is terrible at dealing with it. Um, we have such a, we have such a bizarre system of a nuclear family where, where we don't have all our aunties and grandmas and things like that around us, like, like, so well, there's not, there's not a lot of information out there either about postpartum right it's actually kind of slidden under the rug yeah it's it's not you know people don't like to talk about it is mental illness and people don't like to talk about mental illness um people think don't want to seek treatment for it because they feel like they're they're a bad mum if they do and so people don't want to talk about it um there are a lot of resources out there um oh, out here in the vancouver area there's pacific postpartum depression society um so you can definitely the, those are people you can contact, um, you know, if you're feeling like, you know, you're disconnected from your baby or feeling like you might harm your baby, something like that, reach out. If you, if you don't, somewhere else in the country, reach out to your public health nurse or, or your doctor. So um, we have another question here for you, JM, and you're saying you're a childbirth educator. Does that mean you deliver babies? No, childbirth educator means I teach pre, uh, prenatal and postpartum classes. Um, I was also a doula, which is labor support, and I also don't deliver babies, um, but a doula is just there to support the, the mom in labor. And we also have postpartum doulas, which support moms after the birth. So that's like the Lamaze classes and all that, right? The prenatal yeah. classes? Yeah. So we have a question here. What age do you think breastfeeding should stop? That's a pretty personal question. I mean, it, it really depends. When you look at other mammals, um, breastfeeding, nat weaning naturally happens uh, when the permanent teeth start to come in. I mean, we call them milk teeth, like in horses and puppies and things like that. We call them milk teeth and they fall out and that's, and when they start to fall out, that's usually the natural time um, that mammals wean. Now, um, kids don't start losing their teeth until they're five, usually. 
that's a long time to breastfeed. There is certainly no harm in breastfeeding to that age. Obviously, that's not your your child's so, source sole source of nutrition, um, but there's so many benefits to it. It's it increases you know immune function. Um, I was really sad when when I finally did stop breastfeeding because breast milk makes this wonderful. It's a wonderful antibiotic. So anytime you had like a little little scratch or something on your hand, I, I would put a drop of breast milk on it, rub it in. It's got it's fatty. It's soothing. It felt good and it healed it up. <laughs> it was better than polysporin. Um, so you had this medicine chest attached <laughs> to your chest. <laughs> Yeah, my daughter, yeah, but my granddaughter, when she had an eye infection, she actually gave her milk in the eye and yep. cleaned up the infection. Yep. Yep. Well, it works a charm. Um, so yeah, no, there's no, there's no harm in, in breastfeeding up, you know, up until they're, <laughs> they'll, they'll generally stop themselves. I mean, one thing to, to remind parents who are thinking, well, when will my, if I don't wean my baby, will my baby ever wean themselves? And it's like, there's no child that ever went to college still breastfeeding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they eventually said, hey, you know what, I'm done with this. <laughs> and, there's, and there's no child that ever went to college still sleeping in their parents' bed either for those people worried about co-sleeping. <laughs> yeah, they do, they do grow up and, you know, it's a really small period of time when you think about it over, um, over the course of a lifetime even if even if your kids are coming into your bed when they're five and six years old because they're you know they can't sleep by themselves that's that's still such a small slice of your life to give up you know having your bed to yourself you believe me you will miss it once they're in their 20s <laughs> you'll, you'll miss the, that they came to you for comfort <laughs> so we have another question here uh questions are not coming in in the studio but in they're popping up here on my phone. Uh, is it costly to sword fight? Um, it's sort of as sports go, it's kind of in the medium range. Um, it's not as expensive as horseback riding. Horseback riding is one of the most expensive. Um, it's not as cheap as dance. Dance is probably the cheapest. So it's you do need some equipment. Um, but if you come to Academy Cavallo or Academy Duello, which is the sister school, uh, in Vancouver, we have loaner equipment. So, you know, when you're first starting out, your real only expense is the cost of classes. And our intro class is um, our intro class is $120 for a month. So it's it's not it's, it's pretty affordable. So in the, in another question here we have is where can they get swords? Oh, believe it or not, you can get them on Amazon these days. <laughs> <laughs> right? Amazon got everything. I know. Um, there are a lot of um, there are a lot of retailers. Um, depending what you want, like whether you want a training sword, whether you want a, a replica sword. Um, I didn't. I did mention the steel swords that we use on the ground, but when we're on horseback, we use nylon swords. So they're the same shape, the same proportions as a as a a historical long sword, but they're made out of nylon, so they're a little bit lighter and a little bit safer for the horses because the horses didn't ask for this. That was my biggest fear when I when I first read that you sword were sword fighting on a horse. I was like, wouldn't the horse be afraid like of the banging and the chinging? But like you said, it it almost puts them to sleep, right? So well, they get used to it. I mean, you do the it is the noise that scares them the most at first, right? Like. You pick up a sword and you wave it past their face a few times and, and a well-trained horse goes, oh, okay, this is fine. And then you come and you start tapping it against somebody else's sword and they will pick up their ears and they'll go, oh, 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 what's that noise? And you keep tapping and they go, oh, okay, this is nothing to worry about. Um, so that, and again, the noise of the nylon, we, some, we also use wood swords too. It's, it's loud, but it's not quite as loud as the steel swords. And again, we don't. We just don't use the steel on horseback. Just it's just too risky. So you use the wooden sword on the horse. Wooden or nylon, yeah. So what's the difference, like the nylon between the metal? Like the, uh, the nylon ones are the ones that bend, right? Yeah, they they're they're flexible. Um, 
not not super flexible, but they have some flex, some give to them, and they're they're blunt, like they they cannot be sharpened. Um, you can still. I I have had um, my little finger broken with a nylon sword. Um, like if you hit hard enough with it. Um, but it's they're just generally a lot safer. So Jen, if I JM, if I ask you what your tea is tonight, what would your tea be? Um, well, uh, it's very similar to yours. I mean, I am a teacher, um, and I guess I guess the E would be, you know, editing. <laughs> oh, and the A. And and the I wasn't was, so, I wasn't expecting the editing. I was expecting the educator. Well, <laughs> the editing. So that educating. means you really like editing. You really like putting that final touch on. Well, editing is educational too. Like it's it's uh, because when I when we're editing at, at pop literature, we you know we we do the editing on Google Docs and we do it in suggestion mode so the author can see the edits and has a chance to address them. So it. Sometimes we take stories that are not quite ready for prime time and we work with the author to bring them there. And and those are, are quite rewarding when we get when we get those stories and, and we get them because you it does help uh, it does help authors see how they new authors see how they can how they can word things better, how they can make things clearer for the reader, things like that. So that that would be my E and I guess the the A would be for authorship, I guess, because I do, I do like telling stories. That's, um, and I think stories are important. I, I think stories are how we understand the world, and fiction can be truer than reality sometimes, and fiction can, can be more impactful than, than reality sometimes. Well, storytelling is really important, right? Because it brings back the history as well. You know, yeah. For the future telling. Uh, we could always be telling about the future, you know, visions that we have. I always wondered about futuristic novels and books and that. Like, do they have dreams? Do they have visions? Like, where does it come from? You know, and same as the past. The past, is it, is it something that's within us that we hunger for to understand? You know, because for me, I love history. I, I love understanding the vintage, the detail. Like you don't see that anymore. Like even with wood, like wooding and all that, like building landscapes and mm. staircases and that, there was a lot of detail back in the day. Now you just see like a regular, just a little handle and it's like, there's your railing, right? Yeah. So back in the day, it was really detailed. And I think that's what I like about the history. I love the, the detail of each piece put together. Even the clothing, like I looked at some of the pictures on the covers of your books and I was just like, wow really incredible and then i'm like it must have took a long time to get dressed <laughs> <laughs> it did it did some of those some of those out, historical outfits um you know like if you were in nobility you actually had somebody to help you get dressed because uh in the middle ages the sleeves were separate and they would sew them on every morning like with a basting stitch wow um, and then they could take them off because also your sleeves would get dirty more like you drag, you know, they get dragged through whatever you're working on. Um, but, uh, you know, as you go up through the centuries, you have things like corsets that, you know, you need a maid to help you tighten your corset. Um, and you have many, many layers and elaborate hairdos and things like that that you need help with. But a lot of the, you know, a lot of the peasant dress was also complicated because they had a lot of layers because it was cold. <laughs> they didn't have central heating. Well, in the summertime, though, they must have been really hot because they still wore those extra layers, did they not? Well, they did, but um, well, you you do get used to wearing extra layers, um, and they would, you know, you would see pictures of of peasant women, you know, have, with their skirts tied up around their knees. Uh, you see paintings of them working in the fields with the skirts gathered around their knees, things like that. Um, and they would, you know, you you have the ability to, you know, remove your outerwear, right? You can you can remove your coat 
and you've just got a, a blouse. You probably wear fewer petticoats in the summer than you would in the winter. So was the wardrobe part of your, in, in, what am I looking for? Your encouragement to get into the 17th century? Like no, no. Like I actually, I don't do much uh, dressing up or anything like that. I know there are people who, in, like in the Society for Creative Anachronism, who wear historical garb and things like that. Um, yeah, I, I, that's too much work for me. <laughs> <laughs> I always was like, how long does it take to get dressed? And then how long does it take to get undressed? And then I'm just like, that, that's half the day there right there. <laughs> exactly. Um, and the thing is, I don't actually want to live in the past. I'm fascinated by the past. I love science fiction. I'm fascinated with the future. But if you gave me a choice of living in the past or the future, I'd choose the future. Um, because I don't want to go back to, you know, a lot of times the past is romanticized, you know, it was simpler times and stuff, but, you know, really it didn't, it sucked being a woman in the past. Yeah. I mean, it still sometimes sucks being a woman today, but it really sucked in the past. Uh, your life expectancy was not that great if you were having children. Uh, you know, there was sex, more sexism and racism than we experience today. So, you know, things are getting better. It doesn't, sometimes it doesn't always feel like that, but I do have faith that humanity is, you know, you know, two steps forward, one step back, but gradually making progress. Now, do you think by writing these books that you're bringing a light to women's rights? I hope so. Um, I mean, I am a, I am a raging feminist, <laughs> you know. <laughs> She's a sword holder. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, my my fantasy trilogy is about three women. Um, it is, it's a story, and it's a fantasy, but it's really, it's really women's fiction dressed up as fantasy. It's a story about mothers and daughters, um, and the lies they tell to each other, and and. Uh, you know, and the secrets that they hold. But, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not interested particularly in writing about men because I feel like men have been written about so much. There's so much, so much out there. So much written out there from a male point of view with a male gaze that, that, you know, we could go without any, any more novels from men for a hundred years and we'd still be catching up. So, yeah. So JM, I asked you what your favorite color was and you gave me cobalt blue. Why mm -hmm. that color? Uh, when I used to paint miniatures, that was always my favorite color. It's just um, as, a, as an acrylic paint color, it's my favorite blue. Um, pretty close to the blue on your shirt. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's what, and, and for all the viewers and listeners out there, Miss Liz always asks us what all of my guests, what their favorite color is. And if you're paying attention, you'll see Miss Liz wearing similar colors or close to the color. Because sometimes I get a blue and I'm like, oh, okay, I can wear a blue. But then when I get yeah, a was... certain kind of blue, I'm like, oh, where am I going with this? Well, you got it pretty close. Um, this is, I was actually wearing this earlier today, but it got too warm. So I <laughs> took it off. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, how do I get a cobalt blue? Like that that's a hard one. So I'm gonna have to start looking for color coded clothes here. <laughs> <laughs> so and I also ask you what word describes you as a person and you gave me the word fierce. Why fierce? Um because I I get I can get angry quite easily at injustice. Injustice makes me furious, and and that is you know that is that is when I sort of figuratively you know, pick up my sword and get on my horse. Um, yeah. Well, I think it's within you, right? Because you said like you're a massive feminist and and you, you're for women's rights and all of that, and 
you know, and the horse riding and the writing and the childbirth. Like you, it, it, it tells me a lot about you as a person that you're, don't mess with me. Like, you know, <laughs> I might look sweet, but don't mess with me because I'm fierce. I'm coming for you. Oh, I'm a Leo too. You know? <laughs> oh, well, there you go. Right. <laughs> we had Leo don't mess. Like, <laughs> so any final words and any message that you would like to give to any of the viewers or listeners out there? Um, well, I would say to anybody, like I've done so many different things and we didn't even touch on, you know, artwork and things like that. I do so many things. And sometimes I think, well, you know, I just divide my attention so many ways. How can I ever be good at, at something? But I would not feel complete if I ignored those parts of me, you know, if I ignored the artistic part of me, if I ignored the, you know, the fierce part of me. So, you know, to everybody out there, like embrace what you are Embr and embrace everything that you are, all the parts, even, even the not so great stuff, you know, even, you know, even the traits that other people may not like, whether it's being stubborn or, or, you know, shrill or angry or whatever. It's all needed to be a complete person. Well, it's like you said, right? We didn't even touch on the art or anything because JM usually starts something and then it ends up turning into a profession. We were talking about that in the back <laughs> studio before the show started. And we often do that. Like we pick up a hobby and then we really get into it and we get passionate about it. And then we just, you know, then we got to, dig deeper and deeper and deeper so we have a we have a couple seconds left a couple minutes here before we wrap up i want to get into the art really quick because you're you mentioned the color cobalt blue and you said art so i want to just get into that before we wrap up uh well i don't do as much of it anymore as i would like to but the my first novel i did do pencil illustrations for which my colleague mel then inked I used to draw comic books. I studied with uh, David Lloyd, uh, who you may know from V for Vendetta. Um, and uh, and I, um, I mean, art is in my family. Uh, my mother is a painter. My daughters are amazing painters. They're far better than I am. Um, they do you know, photorealistic animal portraits and things like that. Uh, my great, my great aunt uh, was Prudence Heward, who was uh, one of fairly famous Canadian painter. Um, so yeah, painting is in my blood and art is in my blood. And it's something that I haven't, just like the music, I haven't picked it up enough. And I do want to get back to it at some point in my life. And, and I hope that will be soon. Um, you mentioned the covers of my books. Those are not by me. Those are by the amazingly talented Melissa Mary Duncan. She did the covers of all three of those books, plus um, plus the current issue that I showed you there was um, a popular issue. She did that as well. Um, but it just, it draws me. Like, I love that kind of artwork. It's a beautiful artwork. Really, really beautiful. So I want to thank you, JM, for joining me and having tea with me tonight and sharing a little bit about sword fighting, childbirth, education, postpartum depression. You know, we've, we've touched on a lot of subjects tonight. And to all the viewers and listeners out there who tune in all day to re watch all three tea times, thank you for your support. I really encourage you to check out next Thursday when we have three more new tea times coming. And we do have topics that may trigger some people. So if it does trigger you, I won't be offended if you do not tune in. I do know that you support on the side for those harder subjects. So thank you again. And JM, I want to thank you for bringing the 17th century to the table, some sword fighting and some fierce womanhood because we really do need some strong women out there. <laughs> so again, thank you so much for joining me tonight. And thank you to the listeners, viewers. And you can always watch the replays on the YouTube channel or on all podcast stations at Miss Liz. This tea time can be found on. So again, thank you, and I will see you next Thursday, same time, same place, for three tea times. That's why we're doing three every Thursday for this year. 
So 10 a.m., 3 p.m., and 7 p.m. Three different tea times, three different guests, three different teas to make a difference. So thank you all for tuning in for tea time and for season four. We are out until next week. Thank you.